Professor, good evening to you. Thank you very much for your time. We appreciate it. Uh, we have a lot to discuss tonight, and I want to run through quite a few of the things that are emerging. Um, one of them in the last few days is that increasingly there's discussion about just how airborne the virus is. This has been something that was discussed a few months ago, and, and there was a sense it was mostly from droplets. Is there any new research uh, to suggest that actually uh, COVID-19 is much more airborne than we previously thought? So good evening, Sally. So Sally, I think there is emerging evidence, which is a cause for concern, uh, that we might have underestimated the role of airborne transmission of COVID-19. Previously, the focus was around the whole notion that there's formite spread, which means that you come into contact with contaminated surfaces, you touch the surfaces, and you inadvertently end up infecting yourself. Unfortunately, more recently, based on a number of experiences, including what we term as super spreader events, suggest that in fact there is a fair amount of airborne transmission that's taking place. Uh, when we're talking of airborne transmission, there's sort of two parts to it, but the part that we're really referring to now is where there's micro droplets, which are extremely small, about five micrometers, which is about one tenth of the breadth of a hair are actually suspended in the air for a reasonable period of time and people that are walking in the vicinity, especially if the place is poorly ventilated, might inadvertently end up inhaling those contaminated micro droplets and that could be causing an infection. Uh, exactly what is the relative role of airborne transmission as opposed to uh, fomite transmission, which is contact with contaminated surfaces. And then the third possible re way that you get infected is through direct contact with mm. uh, these contaminated droplets, where people sort of infect uh, another person directly with those droplets landing on the mucous surfaces of the other individual is not completely known. But I think safe to say, I think airborne transmission is probably a reality and it explains the rapid rate at which this virus has been transmitted, including in our healthcare facilities. Yeah, it certainly explains if it, if it is indeed, as you say, increasingly likely, why some people say, I did absolutely everything and I still got the virus. Um, are masks even more crucial than before or are masks actually not going to really help? No, absolutely. The, the mask can't be less crucial than it is now that we're coming to recognize the importance of airborne transmission is absolutely essential, uh, both in terms of, especially in terms of those individuals that might be infected, that might be completely asymptomatic, they themselves might still be transmitting the virus into the environment, into the atmosphere. So irrespective of whether an individual is sick or not, they need to be wearing the mask, and that will allow us to actually sort of attenuate the rate at which others are actually getting infected. So masks are absolutely essential. If we could, what we need to be tending towards, in fact, is the use of surgical masks. But unfortunately, the reality is that there is a shortage of surgical masks, N95 masks, even in healthcare facilities. So we need to continue reserving that for healthcare workers. But the general public, when in public spaces, have to wear masks, including when taking public transport, such as our taxis. <laughs> Uh, even more uh, worrying news, um, reports from Spain today that 95% of the population doesn't seem to have antibodies. Um, does this suggest that immunity might not be happening, that you can get this virus again and again? What does it say? So the way they're measuring uh, what we call immunity at the moment is sort of a serology test which looks for the presence of antibody. And what we do know about this virus is that after you've become infected, uh, many people actually lose that antibody after two to three months. But that doesn't necessarily mean there isn't underlying immunity because there's other cells, what we call T lymphocytes and other memory cells which can rapidly mount an immune response if a person is re-exposed. But the durability of that underlying immunity is unknown. So from the current data, it shows that people that have had severe disease tend to have those antibodies circulating for a much longer period of time, up to about three months, compared to people that have a mild illness. Now, what does it really mean? It means that we can be certain that natural infection is going to induce broad spread community immunity, which essentially is required to be able to break the back of this pandemic. Uh, so that is another uh, really area of concern. Uh, basically, what it really would require then is for us to get the vaccine sooner than later if natural infection is not doing the job that it usually does in terms of inducing immunity that protects one against developing at least severe disease when 
and be exposed to the virus. And I'm going to ask you about how the Vitz vaccine trial is going in a moment, but another piece of concerning news, let's just get all the bad news out of the way, is that the virus may be adapting, um, that it's adapting seasonally. Uh, if that is true, is it true? Is it likely? And if so, doesn't that mean that a vaccine might become outdated um, if the virus is mutating? And so there have been some mutations that they have been observed, including on this protein, what is known as a spike protein. But the nature of these mutations isn't thought to actually uh, result in much effect as to what how the immune system will basically respond upon subsequent exposure. So I think it's still early days. Remember, this virus has just been with us for just over six months now. Uh, but what we can safely say is that the rate of these mutations is nowhere close to the rate of mutations that occurs as an example with seasonal influenza virus or even with HIV virus. So I think it is something that we need to keep our eye on. But at this stage, it would be premature to say that it's going to have a major impact in terms of vaccine development, vaccine design, as well as whether natural infection actually does confirm for a long-lasting immunity. Now, I have to ask about the vaccine trial that you're in charge of at WITS, uh, how it's going. And I was wondering about the rapid rise infections um, that we have in Gauteng. Is that a good or bad thing for the trial? And I'm, I'm asking that because my understanding is that as soon as you get 42 people who are positive on the trial, positive for COVID, you're able to sort of unwrap all the secrecy around the, the double blind, blind trials and that sort of thing and see if it's worked. So is the rise in infections actually good? Because it means you might get results earlier? Well, it might be good news for the vaccine study, but obviously it's bad news for Gauteng and for the country. Yeah. Uh, but in terms of the vaccine study, one of the challenges that it actually poses is that we can only evaluate how well the vaccine works if we allow at least a 14 day up to a one month period uh, from the time the person receives the vaccine to the time of exposure, because we don't expect the vaccine to start working overnight. It takes at least two to four weeks for the immune system to mount an antibody response which is going to confer protection. So getting too many people infected very soon after they enroll into the study doesn't actually assist the study. In fact, it undermines the study. So it's sort of a double-edged sword. On the one hand, we could get the answer much sooner than later, but on the other hand, it's actually posing challenges for the study when huge numbers of people that are coming into the study are already asymptomatic, but they've already been infected or they're carrying, carrying the virus when they're actually entering into the study. So it's really become a challenging study to undertake because mm -hmm. of where we are uh, in this out wave of the outbreak in Johannesburg in particularly. I want to ask you about something that also looks like maybe hopeful news. The SA Blood Service is going to start a COVID-19 convalescent plasma trial. Now, my understanding, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, it's seeing if blood plasma of recovered patients can actually provide immunity to other people. Um, is, this looks like a, a, a great thing potentially, am I right? Look, I mean, I, I've always had my reservations about serum therapy, about monoclonal antibodies, uh, which is sort of uh, a more refined manner of doing serum, what we call serum therapy. And the reality is that even if it is successful, it's very unlikely to be successful in individuals that got severe disease. Because by that time, the immune system has really destroyed tissue, which is causing a person to develop severe disease. Uh, so I think it's worthwhile pursuing, uh, but uh, whether it's going to be successful, especially for very severe disease, I think it's unlikely. In addition to which, I think we need to recognize that the scale at which it can be rolled out is fairly limited. Uh, so it's not something that's going to be used widely. It's simply the type of uh, resources that's required to implement it on a huge scale is a rate limiting factor as well. Well, thank you very much for such comprehensive updates on a very complex issues. The disheartening news, of course, from Professor Shabir Mahdi, that it does look increasingly likely uh, that COVID-19 is airborne. Before, we thought it was mostly just droplet transmission. And the message again, of course, is wear your mask, wear your mask, wear your mask. Thank you very much, Professor Shabir Mahdi.